He's a professor of environmental microbiology in the Department of Environmental Science and Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Arizona. He's authored more than 500 articles and several textbooks. Uh, he's served 12 years on the EPA uh, Science Advisory Board, and he's a member of the American Academy of Microbiology. He wrote all that and told me to say that. What he didn't say was <laughs> he has the most refined sense of microbial toilet humor I have ever met, and I know that he will entertain us. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Talking to us this today, not about toilets, but I'm sure it's going to get in there, uh, the risk of pathogens from vacuum cleaners. Dr. Chuck Gerber. I, I want to acknowledge uh, Sherry Maxwell, who actually did all the work. I used to give the, uh, get the pleasure of giving the talk on this. Why study vacuum cleaners? Um, well, I could say because they haven't been studied much before, but I think a lot of it is a motivation of looking at cleaning tools, the, way, the, the role they play in both cleaning our environment and acting as reservoirs and distribution of pathogens during the cleaning process. Uh, Dr. Liz Scott was actually the first to point this out in one of her early papers in, in Holmes, that there were actually cleaning tools in which aided the spread of, of microorganisms at the same time could serve as reservoirs because the organisms could grow uh, within the cleaning tools and when cleaning was taking place they actually spread the organisms around the household. So I think it's really important. Vacuum cleaning, studies on vacuum cleaning and carpeting and floors we're going to talk about have largely been uh, the realm of studies in, in the uh, uh, hospital environment, in the medical health care industry. Now, I think you'll see that with a lot of the literature we talk about today. It's mainly been in the hospitals and not outside that environment. And here, maybe the focus is a little bit different. It's not so much an overemphasis, I think, on uh, opportunistic pathogens, which we've largely been talking about, but frank pathogens, uh, pathogens that usually are always associated with illness. Uh, in uh, normal, healthy individuals. And so largely the focus I have is away from the hospital environment and in the institutional environment. But first I want to set the stage of thinking about cleaning and cleaning processes and how they've changed, I think. And it's important to understand this when you talk about cleaning and cleaning tools, how things have changed and how diseases may be finding new routes of transmission. We spend most of our times indoors today, unlike 100 years ago, most of us would have been working on a farm and outside most of the time. Uh, or in a factory. More people work in offices than ever before. If you look at the statistics, we're inside. We travel more than ever before, that's quite obvious, and we travel in airplanes and boats, and uh, we don't ride horses anymore. We spend less time cleaning than the last generation, about less than half uh, of the time we spend at home cleaning than we did before. Uh, and we are less clean. I, I always read how clean we are all the time. I sure haven't seen that when you look around and compare. Laundry, I use as the classic example. How many of you use hot water anymore, right? Uh, back in the 1950s, everybody used hot water. And believe me, your clothes came out a lot cleaner than using cold water uh, today. So you, your, your clothes are a lot more germier than your grandparents were, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, that's just one example. We spend more time in public places than ever before. We're out in the public. Uh, we have larger buildings. We have cruise ships, not of 100 people, but thousands of people. They're small cities today. Office buildings are larger. Stadiums are larger. We are more mobile. We have more electronic equipment, uh, more cell phones. All this means is that we share more space and more germs with more people than we ever did before. Uh, and I think we've lost that perspective. We're moving germs around a lot more uh, in society than we ever had before. And that's why understanding cleaning and cleaning tools, I think, becomes important. Uh, there are limited studies in homes and other environments uh, on vacuuming and carpeting, and that's why our, our focus on that. Largely, years ago, it was the hospital environment that people were concerned about. It's serving as a reservoir for microorganisms. Carpeting traps microorganisms in food. Now, if they stay there, a lot of people argue it's a sink. It doesn't really come out uh, unless you're vacuuming or you're, you're doing some deep cleaning in it. Uh, but vacuuming in itself will act to resuspend microorganisms, the physical act of trying to remove them. Why is carpeting important? I think in the home and maybe institutions where there are kids, uh, because there's a lot of contact with the environment with children. They do play on the floor. Uh, I used to actually lay on the floor and watch TV until I see, saw those pictures uh, of uh, dust mites in the carpeting, and it just freaked me out, so I'm off the floor now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in, 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 kids put their hands in their mouths a lot. They're in contact with the environment all the time. They're moving germs around. E recent studies, too, have shown that 
Uh, even uh, adults will bring their fingers, to, if they're alone in a room, bring their fingers to their nose and mouth 18 uh, times an hour, actually. Um, I'll, I'll t maybe I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow the, uh, on recent studies in adults. What are the microbial issues uh, concerning carpeting? Well, the growth of mold, I think everybody's familiar with that, particularly uh, if you're sensitive to mold. Uh, it can affect uh, respiratory and, and cause allergy problems. Uh, bacteria, again, we have the issue of, of potentially transmission of opportunistic pathogens and other types of pathogens uh, via the carpeting. Uh, and there are a lot of bacteria in carpeting too. I, very few studies right, where I could compare number of bacteria to other environments in the same institution or home. I uh, just couldn't find much on that. But carpeting, uh, from the studies I can see, has about 200,000 bacteria aerobic plate count uh, per square inch. To give you a toilet seat, that's the safest place in the world, by the way, if we're ever hit with a biological warfare attack, runs in the bathroom because they seem to always find the fewest number of organisms on a toilet seat uh, uh, for some reason. I guess everybody's afraid of it, so they disinfect it. Uh, more heavily than they probably need to. Kitchen countertops, kitchen floors, bathroom floors, give you a relative idea. Again, you find a lot of organisms in the carpeting, sort of an ideal environment. What do you find there? Uh, we've done a number of studies over the year. I just picked a list of organisms on bacteria detected in household dust from carpeting and that. I was more interested in, in, in putting a list of some of the organisms I, I wouldn't really expect to find, like Pseudomonas or uh, E. coli. Uh, in the uh, initial slide there by Dr. Dancer, she show, only showed that these organisms like E. coli only survive two days on surfaces, yet you frequently find E. coli and Pseudomonas, which doesn't really like dry environments in household dust. Uh, bacillus is a spore former, you probably expect that. Acetobacter you find in there. Citrobacter surprises me, that's not a particularly stable organism on dry surfaces. Uh, Introbacter salkazaki, though, likes dry surfaces, so it's not surprising. Uh, there have been reports in the literature finding salmonella on several occasions in household dust, too. Uh, so you get a variety of organisms, you go, why are these organisms in such a dry surface all the time? Uh, bacteria can also uh, give carpet a nasty smell. smell. They've been responsible for odors, at least in uh, one study that I was able to find in the literature, so they are related to that. Fungi, of course, I, I think that story has been repeated many times. Certain species, and you find all these species in household dust if you actually look through your vacuum cleaner, plus a lot more types of fungi, too. Uh, it's a great place uh, for molds to live uh, and persist. And of course, uh, you always worry about allergens, and if you look at some of the more recent studies, molds are more of a problem with allergens than dust mites, if you actually read some of the more recent literature, more people are sensitive uh, to molds than they are uh, from the dust mites. Endotoxins is another area of concern. Endotoxins are part of the cell wall of certain types of gram-negative bacteria, like E. coli would be your example. Uh, and people are sensitive to these, uh, if you get um, injected with them, you run a fever, and that's always a worry uh, in anything that might be injected in a person. But they can also cause uh, respiratory problems, uh, inhalation. Uh, in certain environments, we have high loads of endotoxin can cause uh, uh, respiratory issues. Uh, not a lot on endotoxin in carpeting. It's very, I've only found a couple of studies on it, but outside of hospital environments. Uh, airplanes was the only really study where they were doing a comparison, where, where they were looking at the carpeting and they found a lot more in the carpeting. But you would expect that if you're finding 200,000 bacteria per square inch, I'd expect to find a lot more endotoxin. Uh, there have been issues about carpeting related to uh, volatile products, microorganisms produced during, during metabolism. Uh, some people believe that the higher levels of microbes in carpeting are related to headache, irritation of the eyes, mucous membrane and that, uh, related to different microorganisms. Microorganisms do produce compounds that get into the air that protect, uh, particularly could have uh, side effects you really don't want. And this is so, somewhat related to your you know, sick building syndrome. Uh, viruses are an issue too. Uh, it doesn't take many viruses to infect an individual, particularly if you have small children drooling, uh, saliva and mucus can get into the carpeting. Of course, if you have noroviruses, you can have vomiting. That gets into the carpeting too. May not be the easiest thing to remove from the carpeting too. Uh, but any type of aerosol settling can also end up in the carpeting. Uh, when you start looking at vacuum cleaners, you really start realizing they're kind of meals on wheels for bacteria uh, because they concentrate all the bacteria in your carpeting and all the food in one place. I mean, what more could you be a, a bacteria but say, you know, suck me up and take me to the food supply uh, because you've just taken all that food and debris and put it in one place. 
the bacteria go like, well, they, they can grow in the collection bag quite readily when they get in there. Uh, that's why you find salmonella uh, in vacuum cleaner dust in that because you're putting in the, where all the food is. Um, and then when you move them, or you have the potential of moving them around all the time, as I'll demonstrate here in some recent studies. And at a recent study, we looked at bacterial contamination of brush rolls uh, from household vacuum cleaners. We looked at 30 of them there. It's hard to figure out how you're going to equate bacteria on uh, brush rolls, but uh, we were looking that we did it per gram of brush roll, and I, there's several grams uh, on every uh, brush roll. But uh, we were looking at it. There's quite a range, about 500 to 1,800 bacteria. Interesting enough, 50% of the brush rolls had coliform bacteria, which you usually associate with toilet seats or toilets, and even 13% of them uh, had uh, E. coli on them, and there, there were also quite a few mold. And again, that surprises because these brush rolls, had taken at least two weeks to get to us. They were collected from homes and that. And it was, it, usually E. coli doesn't survive that long, but when you start looking at the brush rolls, you start to see all this food debris on the bottom and all these food particles and trapped there. And probably what's going on, they're able to uh, persist a longer time or maybe even grow in the trapped food particles within the brush roll. Uh, um, we identified a lot of E. coli, e. coli like I already said, a lot of the common uh, coliform bacteria, even citrobacter, which I usually wouldn't expect surviving very long, a lot of Klebsiella, Cerasia species, uh, just to show that they were really coliform bacteria. We also looked at transfer of microorganisms, both E. coli, Staph aureus, and MS2 is, is a bacterial virus, and it's, uh, uh, we usually use that a lot of times because it's inexpensive to work with, and I don't have to worry about anybody coming infected with it. Uh, and what we did is we, we put this on uh, carpets, we uh, contaminated carpets with these organisms and we, we vacuumed the area and then we moved to a clean carpeting area afterwards and vacuumed it. We found we could move the organisms from one carpeting to the another by just the vacuuming. So if you're vacuuming an area that maybe you have contamination in, you could be moving it to another area during vacuuming. One of the points I, wa I want to make out here too is that the transfer was much greater for the viruses, you're, uh, then the bacteria, you're only talking maybe a tenth of a percent transfer. Where the viruses, you're, you're, you're talking maybe 10% of the virus was transferred. So probably this reflects that viruses are lighter, smaller. Uh, they're somewhat more resistant to dry conditions, volatilization, get, not volatilization, but resuspension in the air. So viruses seem to be easier to move around uh, than bacteria during a vacuum cleaning event. Uh, the other thing is, okay, you know, you sucked up all these bacteria and brought them to, uh, you know, their happy meal, uh, in, uh, and they're in a bag now, just like your happy meal, or they're not. There's a lot of bagless type vacuum cleaners out there. And one of the questions what we had is, you know, here's somebody emptying this, you know, you just concentrated all the salmonella and E. coli and viruses, and you're going to take them out and throw the dust with your hand out. Uh, what are these organisms doing inside these vacuum cleaners? And what we found out that if, you, if they're inside the vacuum cleaner, uh, we looked at total bacteria. This is just the native bacteria there. Looking at the bacteria in a bagless type vacuum cleaner, the numbers of bacteria uh, increased from about 100,000 to over a million within 24 hours, and, and it stayed fairly stable after that. Uh, e. coli certainly within 24 hours grew to a rather large number, and probably because of the dry conditions that it did decrease. Um, we didn't see that so much with salmonella in the bagless vacuum cleaners, but we looked at vac. Uh, Bag type, remember the bag type prevent evaporation in uh, the type. You, you went from uh, uh, you know, the tens of thousands to, to tens of millions uh, within 24 hours. Um, and you, we also see a rather tremendous growth of salmonella in this condition when we did this. It varied with type of vacuum cleaner, interestingly enough. Now, the bag thing is not much as a worry, though. They're growing, but they're inside a bag, and if you sanitarily remove that, it's probably not an issue at all. Uh, whereas the other type of uh, vacuum cleaner, you, you may be pulling it out with your hand in that. So it's something that maybe we should realize, particularly if you're in institutions and healthcare facilities, if you're using bagless type vacuum cleaners, you know, you might want to observe some type of caution or care when you're doing that. And that may, bag type, even though there might be more growth in bacteria, you can seal them. They're sealed when you remove them. Um, what about microbial transfer and movement of microorganisms around? Uh, the place. Uh, basically, we did some studies here where we had people uh, walk through areas where there were dye on the floor to see if they could transport. We, this is an illustration of a, it's their fluorescent compounds looking at uh, your footsteps here. And basically, if you're going to walk through some dust or dirt, you are going to track that uh, along. Uh, but what's interesting, we've been 
uh, around, uh, we looked at the uh, transferability by putting viruses and bacteria fairly large levels because we, we thought they might dissipate rather fast. But again, you're easy, it's much easier to track viruses around than bacteria after you, uh, they're on your shoe at these types of levels. I mean, at least six steps later, uh, you're, you're still depositing some bacteria and viruses as you're moving along on the floor. So you can move them around uh, uh, an individual just by walking around carpeting and, and floors too. Uh, and uh, we looked at shoes a lot. Uh, we did find col uh, E. coli on shoes very commonly. Uh, more, so, you know, in fact, coliforms were about 93% of shoes we tested if they'd been worn at least three months. Um, again, probably uh, the E. coli was a surprise how frequently we found E. coli on the bottom of your shoes. Maybe not. Somebody once wrote a paper that said um, feces is everywhere, it's just a matter of thickness on the planet Earth. So we're probably walking through it all the time because that's where you're picking up the E. coli. Uh, every time you go into a bathroom, too, there's E. coli on the floor. There, there's coliforms on the floor. So uh, think about that next time you put your shoes up on your desk, you know. How many people put their shoes up on their desk here, right? And then they go eat your lunch right after that, right? Okay. So no shoe tapping on your desk. Um, but wh why do you find so many E. coli on the bottom of your shoes? Again, take a look at your shoes when you get a chance. You'll see all these little pizza white specks and food debris right time. Well, again, basically a shoe is a happy meal, again, for a bacteria. You pick it up, you bring it to a food supply. Uh, it probably persists in there. But, uh, so eventually you're going to get poop on your shoes no matter what you do. And bacteria uh, also find a place maybe to uh, find a free meal from you. Shoes on bacteria. Uh, boy, they can be, depending where you're walking, it went anywhere from uh, about 13,000 per square meter to 8, 8 million uh, bacteria per square centimeter. Quite a load on the bottom of a shoe, actually, uh, that you find. Of course, as I said, 96%, I guess it was, for coliform bacteria, and about a third have E. coli uh, on, on the bottom of your shoes. So, you know, uh, you, I always wonder why the dog actually would bring his shoes to you now, actually, if they knew that. I might have another second thought about that, you know, uh, on it. Uh, so what, how can I summarize uh, some of this data for you here? Well, I think carpets are, are, are significant reservoirs of microorganisms and endotoxins. And I don't think this area has really been studied enough outside the hospital environment. Uh, the importance of it in, in uh, reservoirs of microorganisms, the potential for moving microorganisms can be important because vacuuming can move organisms from one location to another. Uh, particularly if you're dealing with like norovirus outbreaks, I, you can move viruses around more readily than bacteria. And it takes fewer viruses generally to have a, a good probability of infecting you. So I think we need to take that into consideration. Pathogens are concentrated along with the vacuum, in the vacuum cleaner along with dust. And you should realize that you've created a situation where they can grow in there. Uh, the same thing may be happening on the brush rolls of vacuum cleaners too. They may actually grow when you start a vacuum cleaner and then another, a few hours later, another day, you may actually have increased the number uh, of enteric organisms at least. Uh, bag type clean cleaners are probably better because they, they can contain the organisms when the bags are removed. They're probably not as much of an issue. Uh, uh, on it, but microorganisms will grow to higher levels, so care is, is advised on that than in the bagless type. Bagless type, if you're going to do that, probably should wear gloves. Uh, you should probably also uh, disinfect the inside of, of the receptacle type vacuum cleaners. I didn't show that work here, but we found salmonella and E. coli would persist and other bacteria for long periods of time in the receptacle type of vacuum cleaner. So you may take all that dust out, throw it away, vacuum again, bring new dust in there, and the organisms that might be already in there, like salmonella or E. coli, may just start growing all over again because they got a new food supply uh, is a consideration. Uh, again, uh, I think the overemphasis, uh, not to uh, overemphasize it too much, but I think we really know more about, we need to know more about carpeting, particularly in institutions, and the role it may play in spreading disease, endotoxins, uh, sick building syndrome, and that, uh, and bacteria in general in these types of environment hasn't been studied enough. And the types of vacuum cleaners that are used in institutions, uh, I think, needs to be a closer look relative to the ones that are, are being used in the home and how they function and how microorganisms may be distributed. Thank you.